Okay, so it's pretty easy to hate on Intel at this point. When it's all said and done, blue team chips are more expensive per watt and often per frame. They often run hotter, even after we got what we wanted with a soldered solution, which arguably didn't change much. All I can speak for today is this little guy right here, the Intel Core i9. 9900K. Its 8 cores and 16 threads may look formidable on paper, and indeed this is the best gaming CPU on the market, but only barely. And you know what else looks formidable on paper? The price. So regardless of where Intel sees it so- Whoops. And conveniently, this video is sponsored by Blue Apron. If you're looking for farm fresh ingredients to be delivered directly to your doorstep in exact proportions, look no further. Blue Apron boxes are packaged safely and securely to ensure your food arrives fresh and you can cook everything to spec in 40 minutes or less thanks to included recipe guides. Trust me, if I can do this, you can too. Fellas, if you're looking to surprise that special someone after a long day of PC building, Blue Apron is your ultimate cheat sheet, let me tell you firsthand. Keep it classy with Blue Apron and sign up today using the link below. By the way, the first 50 people to sign up will save 50 bucks for the first two meals. Okay, so here we go. Regardless of where Intel sees itself in a year or two with respect to the 10 nanometer strife, the fact of the matter is that we've been recycling the same generic architecture for, uh, how many generations now? And this, by the way, is by no means meant to be an affirmation or form of affirmation for the red team. I can appreciate AMD's value proposition. I have several videos talking about this, but it should under no circumstance justify a wholehearted devotion to said company. All you'll end up doing is turning future AMD into the current Intel and nobody wants that. So cut the fanboy crap. Okay, today I put together a Z390 system capable of handling an all core 5 gigahertz or roughly 5 gigahertz overclock for our Core i9-9900K. Our motherboard of choice is the Gigabyte Z390 Designare, a SKU targeted at content creators thanks to its large array of ports and features. Plus it's a sexy board and I like sexy boards. At 5 gigahertz the CPU reached toasty 100 degrees at the hottest core and 100 degrees at the package. This is T-junction in case you didn't know that beforehand, which means these temps likely would have gone much higher had the CPU not heavily throttled itself. And this is with a 360 mil AIO, mind you. So the best I could do was run a manual overclock across all cores to 4.9 gigahertz with a manual V-core of 1.29. Still a great solution for gaming, but a testament to how hot these chips run, and mine is obviously a pretty crappy sample. This thing doesn't seem to benefit much at all from the switch to solder, although we do expect the temps to jump a little bit because we're packing two more cores at around the same frequency inside a very similar package. So yeah, the switch to solder really doesn't seem to benefit the CP much at all. I mean, this could be a poor solder job or it could be poor solder composition, maybe both, but we just know that the CP runs hot. Also at full throttle in this config in Prime 95, the 9900K pulled roughly 215 watts through the 8-pin EPS, almost fully saturating that cable. So manual overclocks to 5 gigahertz likely push a single 8-pin out of spec, which explains why the Z390 Designare boasts an additional 4-pin CPU power connection. This dwarfs, by the way, the 8700K's power draw with the same workload and frequency. These extra two cores are very difficult for Intel to manage, and again, such a small package at the same high frequency that Intel's used to running these chips at. What we'll do for the remainder of this video is look at actual eight core CPU applications like Blender, content creation, and streaming. We'll throw in games as well, uh, but this is not something you wanna buy just strictly for gaming, I don't think at this point, because you can get, as you'll see here shortly, six core variants that perform almost identically. And to reiterate, many multi-threaded workloads still won't properly utilize 16 threads, let alone eight. This all comes back to the point of the core race to begin with. So AMD emphasized higher core counts since arguably Bulldozer, but they didn't stop cutting corners until Ryzen, at which point eight cores, you know, true eight cores, more on FX architecture here, became rather mainstream. So despite their lackluster improvements over four and six core counterparts, Ryzen 7 series CPUs have been doing quite well in the consumer market, and that leads us finally to the eight core Intel equivalent today. The remaining CPUs were overclocked to their highest stable frequencies with the same 360 mil AIO. So we have 4.9 gigahertz for the 8700K and 8600K to match our 9900K conveniently, and 4.2 gigahertz for the 2700X we're going to test in this video as well. The same 16 gig kit of 3000 megahertz DDR4 from Corsair was also used for all three, or actually all four of these tests. So the 9900K is just barely the best gaming CPU around. At this point, we expect nothing less, but 
Most of the margins here between our top three contenders in particular are extremely slim. In fact, even our core i5 overclocked to 4.9 is working wonders with its six cores and six threads. Remember, no multi-threading here. And this extends often to four core territory as well, though marketing hype over core counts would lead you to believe that four core CPUs are inadequate for gaming in 2018. To be completely honest, if I shoved an i5-7400 into the mix, which I did for a couple of games, the step down in frame rate is typically very gradual. Now sure, there are exceptions, it's easy to point out the exceptions, right? But I can count on one hand the number of games today that appropriately utilize more than four cores, and that's saying something. So games today still largely leverage frequency and IPC, and in the case of GTA V, optimization in general is probably a stronger factor, I would say, than anything else, although this does lean slightly in favor of Intel, I think we get a better representation overall of what to expect in most games. Now, where we start to see this fall apart is in the streaming department. See, while hosting a 5 megabit per second stream, which is pretty conservative, with an X264 encoder, which stresses the CPU, the staircase widens out just a bit. But while the 9900K does a significantly better job than, say, the Core i5, the 8700K and 2700X still hold their own. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between any of these CPUs while streaming and gaming simultaneously, let alone one or the other. Especially when overclocked, all of these CPUs are up to the task, yes, even our Core i5 at 4.9. It obviously isn't the optimal solution, but it'll do. So far, all we've gotten from our Core i9 over its smaller counterparts is a hotter room and significantly more power draw. I said this in a previous video, but I need to be extremely impressed with at least one aspect of these tests for the 9900K in order to recommend it at its current selling price of around 550 bucks, assuming it's even in stock for that price. So let's try rendering then. Adobe Premiere isn't the best program admittedly to run in the sense that it doesn't properly utilize much past around six threads, but it's the program that I use on a near daily basis for video editing and rendering. The Adobe Suite, though painfully frustrating at times, is great at what it does and that's why it is so popular. So starting out, I dragged a 1 minute 4K 30fps video clip onto the timeline and applied the warp stabilizer distortion effect, which attempts to smooth out shaky footage. Our testing several months ago revealed that this is a largely single threaded workload, so we shouldn't expect to see much of a difference here between our Core i9 and Core i5 counterparts. And sure enough, things are quite similar across the board for the blue team. Our frequencies match, the architecture is practically unchanged, and the remainder of our system was literally identical. Next up, scrubbing a heavy timeline at full scale. Weaker chips will fail this test pretty hard. Ultimately, this just comes down to subjectivity. If I notice that the timeline is scrubbing better, uh, you know, I have less skips overall for a certain CPU over a competitor, it'll rank higher on this chart. So in this case, the i9 is definitely scrubbing better than the 8700K, which in turn scrubbed significantly better than its Ryzen counterpart, likely due to the presence of an IGP in these Intel chips. Premiere Pro software enhancements, pretty recent software enhancements, along with QuickSync software enhancements, allow integrated graphics to run in tandem with CUDA acceleration, drastically improving scrubbing features and render times. Speaking of which, our last content creation test revolves around those render times. Here we expect clock speed to play more of a role than raw core count. This is just the nature of the program again. So a five minute 4K video file in this case rendered using the YouTube 4K preset places a 9900K just ahead of the 8700K, not far, about a 30 second spread here. The 2700X does a fair job as well in this regard, despite its lack of an IGP, just something to point out since the CPU is significantly cheaper than its eight core blue team rival. And this is where, well, the remainder of the video becomes rather pointless. I mean, I ran a few 3D Mark tests you can see here with these CPUs as well as Blender and Handbrake scenarios, but they're meant to do many things at once. And yet, no matter how hard I tried, I could not get the 9900K to do anything the 8700K and 2700X couldn't. I even opened 50 Chrome tabs, all with YouTube videos playing in the background while streaming and gaming in an attempt to stunt the lower tier CPUs, but no, our 16 gigs of RAM, which should be pretty obvious, became the bottleneck instead. So what should you conclude then from these tests, right? That the Core i9 is overpriced? 
Well, yeah, I mean, we said that in the beginning. But even if we assume an extremely conservative price of, say, 450 bucks for this thing, I still say it's overpriced. From precedent alone, it should be no more than $400. That's my opinion. The 8700K gave us two extra cores than the 7700K before it, but we never paid 500 plus USD here in the States. I mean, maybe for a very short amount of time, but it was never permanent. And this all ties back in part to the supply shortage we discussed in this video right here. It also ties into the fact that Intel's a company with a large market share. They have their shareholders, profit margins, and customers just like AMD, though I'm left questioning why this CPU even exists in the first place. So what was Intel thinking? Well, they were thinking about money. They were thinking about their shareholders, their profit margins, what we just said. I mean, like any other company out there, especially a company that's public, I mean, this is no different than AMD. I'm not trying to separate Intel from AMD in this sense. They're, they're all the same. AMD just looks to be a more consumer-friendly option right now because they're not in a sense, charging more than they probably could or should for a product. You can blame the supply shortage all you want, but if Intel really wanted to sell these things to the masses, they would price it much lower than they currently are, and they would find ways to increase uh, the supply so that consumers could actually get their hands on them and test them. I'm kind of surprised I even got one of these, especially now. I mean, you can't find them, but for 800 bucks or so uh, from third-party sellers on sites like Newegg. So Intel knew that people were going to buy the CPU despite its 200 plus watt power draw under an overclocked load, despite its toasty temperatures, even with just MCE enabled, and despite the fact that a beefier motherboard would likely be needed for any manual overclock. They knew all the stuff going into it, and they knew they would probably still sell these well. I think they wish they had more supply to meet the demand. There's still a heavy demand for the CPU, despite what reviewers like myself might tell you, but I, this is definitely not my favorite CPU. Um, and I actually have a video, again, coming up regarding my favorite Intel CPU. I already did my favorite AMD CPU right here. Uh, so that video is coming soon, but it is obviously not the 9900K. It is too expensive at this price. I think it's too expensive arguably at 450 bucks. I think it should be priced at 400 bucks or slightly below that. Then it would make sense in my eyes. Eight cores really does most people no good to be completely honest. Six cores is kind of the sweet spot right now. Uh, so the 8700K is what I would recommend or the 8086K, whichever one is cheaper. They've again been fluctuating due in part to the supply shortage. Uh, but in a nutshell, my conclusion is this, don't buy the 9900K, buy something that's a little more reasonable for the average user, for the typical consumer. Eight cores, again, it's, I think it ties a lot into the marketing hype. We promoted eight cores with Ryzen, but it was cheaper. It was significantly cheaper than 550 bucks right now, again, for a small percentage in, in frame rate bumps over the 8700K, which was already the gaming king. So that's my conclusion. I kind of went off script there, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a heart to heart at the end of this one, uh, because you should definitely be smart with your money in this case. And it's easy to say, oh, I want the best of the best of the 9900K is what I'm gonna buy. But you could be a lot smarter with your purchase and see next to no difference at all by choosing to forego the 9900K uh, for the 8700K, let's say, or even the 8600K or the 2700X or the 2700 or even the 2600. There are so many options out there uh, and frankly, a lot of them are much better purchase choices, uh, purchase decisions than the 9900K. Okay, I'll stop rambling now. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. Dislike it for the complete opposite feeling, or if you hate everything about life, you guys can click that red subscribe button down below, by the way, that's what it's for. And I'll catch you in the next one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for benchmarking with us.